Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if you are new here. I hope you're all doing so 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 well. Welcome back to another true crime and makeup episode. Oh yeah. Today we are covering this mental looking guy. This guy looks like he's got sheep's wool for hair, cotton candy for hair. He looks like Santa Claus gone rogue. I'm sorry Santa, that's offensive. But he honestly does. And this man was a complete and utter monster who would target young women from teenage years up to their mid twenties, early thirties. This man just targeted anyone he could possibly get his hands on. And these young women, they would be tortured and brutalized in the most horrific ways before eventually being murdered. Before we do get into today's case, please, please, please make sure you are subscribed with the notification bell on because I'm here for you twice a week, every single week with a new interesting true crime case. Also, the merch is coming, guys. The merch is coming. I've been working on stuff behind the scenes. How very YouTuber of me. But I've been working on some merch designs behind the scenes and things are starting to come together. And I'm so excited and I hope you will be too. N no stress, like no pressure if you don't want to pick anything up. Don't, don't waste your money if you don't want to. But I know you've been asking for some merch for a long time and I decided the time was right. Also, if you're new here, hi, my name is Anna. I am a certified yapper and one day decided to hop on the internet and yap about true crime. All things that I am passionate about. Hopefully find a community of people who are like myself and I got very lucky and think I found you. If true crime is your jam, I highly suggest you subscribe because I will be here twice a week, every single week. If you're a regular here, then you know the drill. Please, please, please make sure you leave a comment down below, engage with this video in some way, help get me pushed out in the YouTube algorithm because we all know it is playing me profusely. Any important details that you need are all linked down below, so be sure to check that out. But without any further rambling and any further ado, let's get into the horrific case of Richard Cottenham, the cotton candy haired freak that he is. Mm. Oh wow, really good. There's many things I love about Halloween, but lollipops, especially pumpkin ones, um, probably my favourite. Like I usually hate anything orange flavoured, like I love oranges, but like orange flavoured, like fruit pastels, um, wine gums, starburst, don't like them, but this tastes like bubble gum. B and M's finest. And today's video is sponsored by B and M. <laughs> I'm joking, it's actually not. I don't get sponsorships. No one wants to pay me. So Richard Cottenham, he is known as a Times Square killer. He is the torso killer. He is evil and kind of has me wondering, right? I'm going to insert the photo that I'm looking at right now. Here it is. A very good eyes. But his name Cottingham, I'm thinking, is that because his head of hair looks like a ball of cotton wool? Bro looks like Santa Claus gone rogue. Like, what's up with his face? What's up with his hair? Like, he really should have got a hairdressing appointment before that mugshot was taken because not a look. So little candy floss haired Cottingham, he was born on November the 25th of 1946 and he was born in a neighbourhood called Mott Haven in the Bronx in New York City. Now Richard, he was the first of four siblings and whilst his siblings appeared to be normal with regular interests, it would be clear from a very very young age that cotton haired candy Richard Cottingham, uh, he wasn't normal at all and his interests also not normal. So in 1948 Richard Cottenham and his family they moved to Dumont, New Jersey and then in 1950 1956 are you 56 what? Nah. Nah. In 1956 they would move to Rivervale, New Jersey. They didn't really stay in the same place too long. Listen I don't know maybe there was something in the water in the river at Rivervale assuming it's got a river. But at the age of 10 years old, Richard Cottenham, you know, cotton candy haired Cottenham, he would develop a very, very, oh my God, I just realised what his hair reminds me of. Sheep's wool. Sheep's wool. That's it. I mean, they are cotton wool, wool, sheep's wool. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting sheep's wool hair vibes from him. But just at the age of 10 years old, he would become very, very interested obsessive and fascinated with bondage pornography. 
you know, I've got questions. Uh, where do you first hear about bondage pornography at the age of 10? Where do you find it? How do you source it? I don't know, but he did. So, I mean, it might come as a, a shock and a surprise to some, but Richard Cotton, I'm growing up, he didn't really have any friends. He considered his mother to be his best friend, which could be cute, but it's not really, it's kind of weird. Um, on Richard's part. But to be honest, Richard, he never really had any interest in making friends his own age anyway. And I mean, listen, I don't know how well it would go down when his friends are playing with action men and Barbies and he wants to watch bondage porn. And they're all watching like Barney the Purple Dinosaur, Bear in the Big Blue House. It's not gonna go. So by 1964, Richard, he graduates from Pascack Valley High School in Hillside, New Jersey. Pascak, Pasca, Pascak. It's spelled like that, but I'm going to guess it's not said like that. So, New Jersey peeps, let me know down below. Now, much like Rodney Alcala, not long, not long, talk sense, Anna. But much like Rodney Alcala, who we covered very recently, Richard, in the school yearbook, he was noted as being part of the track and cost, cost cut. But he was noted as being part of the track and cross-country teams. So, you know, they have stuff in common and it doesn't end there. And I suppose, you know, if you're going to take on the lifestyle of being a criminal, it's probably good to be a good, fast runner, a strong runner, because you're going to be doing an awful lot of running from the police. So that's a skill you're going to need. So after his high school graduation, Richard, he jumps right into the workforce. He is ready to earn a living. So he works for Metropolitan Life, which his dad was actually the vice president of. So, you know, it's, it's given Nepo baby. Would he have got it otherwise? Probably not. So at first, Richard, he is working in the mailroom at the firm's Manhattan headquarters. And eventually, he would become a computer mainframe operating person after taking a few courses. And since he had got himself some new skills, in October of 1966, he would work as a computer operator at the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association. And he would work in here right up until 1980. And we're going to dive into what happens in the 80s. And whilst he was working at the Blue Cross, he would work with a horrific, horrific human being. And that is the horrific murderer that is Rodney Alcala. I told you, they weren't finished with each other. I will say though, Richard Cottenham and Rodney Alcala, they said that they were not aware of each other when they were working together. Like they didn't know the other one was a murderer. They weren't teaming up or anything like that. Thank God. And of course, at this point, Rodney Alcala, he was operating under his alias of John Berg Berger, Berger, John Berger, John Berger, Berger. I don't know. Don't really care. <laughs> and then on May the 3rd of 1970, Richard Cottenham bags himself a wife with that hair and that face. I don't know how either, but somehow he bagged himself a wife. This wife was Janet and they would marry at Our Lady of Lord's Church in Queens, New York. Now, I don't, is, it La is it Lady of Lordess or Lords? Because it's spelled different. It's spelled different from Lords, which makes me, makes me, makes me, <laughs> which makes me think that it's Lordess. But the couple, they would go on to have three children of their own and they would have two boys and one little girl. So at first, the marriage between Richard and Janet, it seemed somewhat normal. Some might even say happy, at least from the outside looking in. Um, I'm not going to say it was an exciting, amazing life that they led because it's cotton ball headed cotton them, but it seemed all right. It was average. However, it wouldn't be too long into the marriage where Janet believed that cotton them, he was leading a double life. He had his own apartment in New York City and he said that he had to keep this apartment on for when he was working late nights. So he had somewhere to work, somewhere to crash if he was working too late. Hmm. If I was Janet, I would be making some unannounced appearances at that apartment because like, what's going on there? I don't believe it's work. As we have already stated, Richard, he had a very strong, unhealthy obsession and fascination with bondage. Janet, on the other hand, wasn't too keen. Now, what Richard couldn't get from Janet, he was going to get elsewhere, any means necessary. 
So Richard, he starts having all these extra marital affairs. He was doing this so he could fulfill his deepest, darkest desires. And listen, I just want to state before I go any further ahead, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with bondage, if that's what you're into, if that's what floats your boat, if that's what tickles your pickle, that's fine. Absolutely, you do you as long as it's consensual and safe. That's okay. But Richard, his fantasies went a bit further than just, you know, tickling with feather dusters or putting on leather straps or smacking his ass and calling him Judy. He wanted to murder whilst he had sex. And I don't know anyone who would sign up for that. Take away the things that Richard does to his victims, right? But he was just the worst husband you could ever imagine. He would make Janet feel like she was disgusting after giving birth to their children. Now, after she gave birth to the third child, Richard outright refused to have sex with Janet. He just thought like, mm, you know, you've had three children come out. Mm, no, not my vibe. Don't want it. Let's not have sex again. I'll just keep going elsewhere. And you can't do anything like that. So in April of 1978, Janet decides that she cannot put up with his shenanigans any longer. Her clams are getting steamed on the daily. She just, she can't live like that anymore. So she would file for divorce and she stated the grounds of mental cruelty and abandonment. Now Richard, he was taking all the money out of the house leaving the household without sufficient funds to like feed and water them, his three children and his wife. He just did not give a tiny rat's ass about anyone but himself. Before Richard was identified as the serial killing monster that he was, he would be arrested on multiple different occasions for lesser charges. And of course, at the time of these arrests, the police, they had no inkling or indication or any reason to believe that Richard Cottenham could be behind any of the murders going on. And honestly, like they hadn't even put two and two together to work out that there was a serial killer within the tri-state area. So on October the 3rd of 1969, it's October 3rd, Richard Cottenham, he would be charged and convicted with drunk driving, but he would receive a slap in the wrist. He would receive a very small fine of $50. Hmm. Well, that'll teach him. Now, on August the 21st of 1972, he would be charged with shoplifting. He had, like, robbed a Stearns department store in Paramus, New Jersey. He was given the choice, right, of paying a $50 fine or spending 10 days in jail. Now, me, I think I'd take the 10 days in jail because... <laughs> Every penny counts in this economy. So on September the 5th of 1973, free, free, what? 1973, Richard Cottenham, he would be arrested and charged with oral sodomy, robbery, and sexual abuse of a sex worker. Now, devastatingly, this case would be dismissed because the unnamed sex worker didn't want to appear in front of a judge and tell her story. So ultimately, he was just let go again. And then on March the 12th of 1974, Richard would be arrested again for the unlawful imprisonment and sexual abuse of another sex worker. And this case again would be dismissed. And I have to say for me, this just makes me believe that this guy was so bloody cocky and arrogant. He believed that he was invincible and could get away with absolutely everything. The fact that he wasn't even trying to fly under the radar, he was putting himself on the radar and being arrested by police doing these horrific crimes tells you everything you need to know. I'm honestly getting so overstimulated. My sister's in her room drying her hair. And then when I filmed this, the 5th of November, firework night. People are letting off fireworks. It is it's 10 past five, people. I haven't even had my dinner yet. Now, before we do get into the horrific murders committed by this cotton candy haired freak, we're going to talk about the vicious, vile and horrific attacks that he committed on multiple young women. So on March the 22nd of 1978, a 22-year-old pregnant waitress by the name of Karen Shilp, she had met Richard Cottenham around 9pm at her job. Now, Karen, she would exit a Third Avenue bar and she started making her way back to her apartment when she would be picked up by Richard Cottenham. Karen, she's pregnant and the idea of getting a lift home sounds great. So when Cottenham asks her, you know, do you need a ride home? She accepts, thinking that this is just a nice man who she has met prior. 
Now, when Karen gets in the vehicle, Richard Cottenham threatens her and forces her to ingest a large amount of sleeping pills. After she's ingested these sleeping pills, he then continues to drive down Route 80 in New Jersey. But early the next morning, a patrolman, he would find a motionless body lying near the Ledgewood Terrace Apartments in a parking lot. Now this body that was lying there motionless, this was Karen Shilp. Luckily, she was still alive, but she had been brutally injured. It was very clear just from looking at Karen Schilt that she had been sexually abused, sexually tortured. Her vagina and both of her breasts were exposed. On the night of October the 10th of 1978, 19-year-old Susan Geiger, she would be propositioned by Cottenham. She was a sex worker and she was working between Broadway and 7th Avenue on West 47th Street. Susan had told Richard that she had plans for that evening so she wasn't available but she would leave her contact information for him if he wanted to get in contact with her. So the next evening Cottenham decides that he's going to contact Susan Geiger and asks if she wants to meet up, if she wants to go on a date. At this point it's midnight. If you're going to call me at midnight for plans it's going to be a firm no. Actually you're probably not going to get a reply. Now Susan she's not busy, she doesn't have any plans and she decides hey, might as well, might as well go out. So they go for some drinks and what Susan doesn't realise is while she's having drinks with Richard Cottenham, he is plying her drinks full of prescription drugs, mostly sleeping pills. And this is when the evening would go dark for Susan. So later that day, Susan wakes up, she's covered in her own blood and she's in room 28 of the airport motel in South Hackensack. She has no idea how she got there and she has no idea why she's covered in blood. And to her very horror, Susan discovers that she's been brutally tortured. Susan had injuries to her face, her neck, her entire body, her breasts, her vagina, her rectum. The injuries were extensive. She had also been savagely beaten and her earrings had been torn right out of her ears. Then on May the 12th of 1988, a sex worker by the name of Pamela Weisenfeld, she was found badly, brutally beaten in a parking lot in Teaneck, New Jersey. Now her medical reports would reveal that she had bite marks all over her body. After she had met with Cottenham, she had been drugged, then she was beaten and sexually abused. Her injuries were so severe that she was required to be rushed into hospital immediately for medical attention. And it's just so sickening to think what these women have endured, what they've gone through and the trauma from that, but also from waking up, no idea what's happened to you, just feeling this pain over your body and then things slowly coming back to you. So then on May the 22nd of 1980, Richard Cottenham, he would pick up an 18 year old sex worker by the name of Leslie Ann O'Dell. Now Leslie, she was working the corner of Lexington and 25th Street, Manhattan. Richard approaches her, you know, propositions her. Leslie agrees to go back to a motel with him. He would check in to the Hasbrook Height Quality Inn in room 117. So Richard and Leslie, once they're back in the motel, Richard says to Leslie, you know, like, if you want, I'll give you a little massage. It'll be really nice, really sensual. And Leslie at this moment in time is thinking, oh, it's just like a sensual gesture. Get a nice little massage, it'll be great. So she agrees and she rolls over onto her stomach, like exposing her back for Richard. So Richard, he hops on top, straddles over her. And this cotton candy haired freak, he pulls out a knife unbeknownst to Leslie and instead of feeling hands going down her back and massaging her, Leslie would be shocked to feel the sharp cold steel blade against her throat. And this is a moment when Richard Cottenham, he would snap handcuffs onto Leslie, immobilising her. Now right away, Cottenham just gets so vicious and vile with Leslie, he immediately starts torturing her so severely, he nearly bites off one of her nipples. Now, later Leslie would testify and she said the following, which is so bloody disturbing. So Cottenham had said to her, you have to take it. The other girls did. You have to take it too. You are a whore and you have to be punished. Could you imagine hearing that whilst enduring the most evil torture imaginable? Like it is just terrifying. It is something straight out of a nightmare. 
Now, during this torture, Richard had threatened Leslie with a gun and at one point Leslie had witnessed Richard placing this gun down beneath the bed. So when the moment's right and she has that opportunity, she reaches down, she grabs the gun and she fires it at Richard, only to realise this gun is fake. No bullets come out, no damage is done and Richard just stares at her with this menacing, evil, satisfied look in his eye and then he runs toward her with a knife. Now, of course, with Richard charging towards her with this knife, Leslie knows what's about to happen and she screams out, oh God, no. And luckily, some miracle takes place. Employees, they are summoned to Leslie's room where they would witness this horrific torture and abusive scene that was happening before them. And immediately, the employees they call the police. Now, thankfully, the police, they arrive very quickly and they immediately arrest Richard in the hallway. Now, on Richard, he had handcuffs, he had two leather straps, he had a leather gag, he had two slave collars, a switchblade knife, a replica pistol, and a stockpile of prescription drugs, which he had been using to drug women along the way. Now, the charges that he had listed on the indictment were quite extensive, so I'm just going to read them out to you so I don't miss any. So he had kidnapping, attempted murder, aggravated assault, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, aggravated sexual assault whilst armed times three, one for rape, two for sodomy and one for fellatio. Why does he two for sodomy? That would make it four. One for rape, one for sodomy and one for fellatio, possession of a weapon and possession of controlled substances. So, you know, the list is long. It's like my Christmas list. Apart from I don't ask for stuff like that on my Christmas list. <laughs> Let's just get that clear. Also, apologies if you're not here for the makeup, but like how pretty is that eye? Perfect for the festive season. Now, after Richard's wife, Janet, had initiated the divorce proceedings back in 1978, Richard had started to keep a locked room. And this was like in the basement apartment of their house. So it was a room that Janet didn't have any entry to. Now, when he was arrested in 1980, the police decide there's probably going to be something that we want to see in that locked up basement. So alongside his vehicle, they search the basement and they would find items that belong to several victims and this would allow them to link Richard Cottenham to many cases. So during the 1981 trial for Leslie O'Dell, three other rape victims would come forward to testify against Richard Cottenham. These were Karen Schilt, Susan Geiger and Pamela Weisenfeld. They would tell the court, the judge, the jury about the abuse and torture that they had endured at the hands of Richard Cottenham. Now, Susan Geiger and Karen Schilt, they were able to identify Richard Cottenham from a police lineup and also in the court. And Richard, he would be convicted on three out of four of these cases. The one that he would be acquitted on was Pamela Weisenfeld, which is ridiculous. But I mean, they've got him on the other ones. But if I was Pamela... I would not feel like justice had been served because what do you mean this guy's getting off on my case? Now, with victims' belongings being found, the police were actually able to link Richard Cottenham to two murders of two young women. That was Marion Carr and Valerie Street. Around 7am on December the 16th of 1977, the body of Marion Carr, better known as Marzi, would be found. Marzi, she was just 26 years old. She was an x-ray technologist and her body would be found between a parked van and a chain-linked fence in Little Ferried, New Jersey. At the time her body was discovered, Marion was still wearing her white nurse's uniform, but her shoes were nowhere to be found. Marion, she had last been seen on December the 15th, and this was in the parking lot at the Ledgewood Terrace Apartments. Now, one thing that you should know about these apartments is Richard Cottenham, he had previously lived there. It was later discovered that Cottenham had kidnapped Marion from her apartment complex took her back to the Hasbrook Heights Quality Inn and this is where the murder would take place. Once Marion was inside that inn, the most evil and vile torture would be inflicted upon her. She was beaten, she was bitten all over her body, she was slashed, she was raped, she was restrained and strangled with a ligature. 
After Richard was finished with Marion, he dumped her body in the parking lot. She had bruises on her ankles and her wrists from the restraints and there was also still like a white adhesive from the tape stuck around her mouth. Richard Cottenham would be convicted for her murder on October the 12th of 1982. On May the 5th of 1980, the body of 19-year-old Valerie Street, who was a sex worker, her body was also found by a motel worker at the Quality Inn, the same inn where Richard Cottenham had disposed of Marion's body. Valerie, she had checked into this motel. She checked into room 132 with a man who was going under an alias. And this man was Richard Cottenham. Devastatingly, Valerie, she had been strangled. She had been gagged with adhesive tape. She had been bitten all over her breasts, all over her body. Like there was bite marks on her head. And her breasts had multiple knife incisions made to them. Now, once Valerie was dead and Richard Cottenham was satisfied with what he had done to this innocent young woman, he stuffed her body under the bed in the motel so the housekeeper would find it. Not only has he committed the, one of the most vicious murders that we will ever hear of, but this poor housekeeper who has went in just to do her job, clean the room, to then discover the lifeless body of a young woman who has been brutally tortured, that's trauma that you would not get over. Now, a fingerprint that belonged to Richard Cottenham would be found on the ratchet mechanism of the handcuffs, which would lead him to be convicted for Valerie Street's murder. And he would be formally convicted on June the 12th, 1981. And then in 1984, Richard Cottenham, he would be brought to another trial in New York City for the murders of three additional women. On December the 2nd of 1979, around 9am, there was a call made from the Travel Lodge Motor Inn to the fire department. Now, employees, they had seen a significant amount of smoke coming out of one of their rooms, 417, and this room was being rented by a Carol Wilson from November the 29th. So how many days is that? Three? 30 days has to temporary April, June and November. Three? I think it's three. So the firefighters, they arrive very quick and they immediately enter the motel room. Now, there's significant amounts of smoke, like this place is up in flames, so obviously they can barely see, but they immediately are able to spot two naked females on two separate beds. Now, one of the firefighters trying to see through the smoke, he runs over, grabs one of these females off of the bed, takes her out into the hallway, and he goes to perform mouth-to-mouth -mouth CPR on her. Only when he goes to do this is when he would realise this body doesn't have a mouth because it doesn't have a head. This young female had been beheaded. It was immediately clear that both of these young women had been completely brutalised and then their murderer had tried to set them on fire to dispose and discard of any evidence. Both of these young women had been beheaded and their hands had also been removed. And it's awful, but both their heads and their hands have never been found to this very day. Now, an autopsy that would be performed on these women would reveal that they had been alive for days when they're being tortured and abused in the most horrific ways. Now, an identification was able to be made on one of the females, and that was Dida Gudarze. Now, she was a 22-year-old sex worker who had been spotted with Richard Cottenham the night before the fire. The other female has never, ever been identified. She is known as the Manhattan Jane Doe. But I don't know why, like, when, when it's a Jane Doe case, it just makes me so emotional because... Like someone somewhere is missing a family member and it could be her, but she's unidentifiable because she doesn't have her hands, she doesn't have her head. And if her body's been so badly burned, there might not be any identifying features that they can use to claim their loved one. And this poor young woman is just known as the Manhattan Jane Doe. I, I find that to be so dehumanising sometimes and yeah, I don't know, it makes me upset. Richard Cottenham, he has never even gave like an inkling as to who this Jane Doe could be. Now, when her body was examined, they said that she could have been as young as 16 years old. Richard Cottenham had also admitted that he had taken the hands and the head 
thrown them away, discarded of them, so their bodies couldn't be identified. Then on May the 15th of 1980, the body of 25-year-old Mary Ann Jean Rayner would be discovered. She had been discovered at the Seville Hotel in New York City. Her throat had been slashed and both of her breasts had been removed. And these breasts were found on the headboard of the bed. The murderer, Richard Cottenham, cotton candy haired freak, he had removed her breasts and sat them up like some kind of trophies on this headboard. Cottenham, he had also set Marianne on fire in order to try and discard of any evidence to make her unidentifiable because this is what he seemed to get off on is his victims not being able to be identified. So Sheep's Wool haired Cottenham, he swore up and down to start with after his initial convictions that he was not guilty of the murder. He said that he was a victim himself because someone was out to get him. He had been framed, of course, because it's always going to be Patricia, right? However, as time went on, as you can imagine with a lot of these serial killers, they want to get acknowledgement for their work. And it would be 2009 when he finally admitted that he was the perpetrator in those five murders. I mean, you're convicted anyway, so like, whatever, but I mean, at least they admitted it, I suppose. So in 2000, a detective in the BCPO, he was handed the mammoth task of going back over cold cases from the 1960s and the 1970s. Now, this detective was Robert Anzalotti. Now, right away, Anzalotti believes that Richard Cottenham could be responsible for at least one of these murders. But he was thinking it's most likely he's been responsible for most, if not all. So it was in 2003 when Robert Anzalotti, he decided that he was going to go and meet with Richard Cottenham and he would do this for years and years after to try and get the confessions out of Cottenham. So he would sit down with Cottenham, he would discuss the murders, they would go over the crime scene, the crime scene photographs, just to try and, you know, get, get his juices flowing, get him wanting to take credit for these murders. And Anzalotti, he would have to work with Richard Cottenham for a very long time before he would get any answers. So, you know, it's been seven years and Richard's thinking, eh, maybe I need to give up something to this guy. So in 2010, Richard Cottenham, he would confess to a 1967 murder. And then in 2014, in exchange for immunity from prosecution, Richard would then confess to an additional three murders. So on a positive note, three cold cases were able to be closed by the BCPO. Now this was done in agreement with the families of the victims alongside the evidence that corroborated the confessions. Now the only thing is, is whilst the families were allowed to know that Richard Cottenham was responsible and solve these cold cases, they weren't allowed to announce it to the public because they feared if they announced it to the public and word started to get around, maybe Richard Cottenham would stop talking and they needed him to keep talking because God knows how many other murders he's responsible for. So then in April of 2021, yeah, like it's that recent, in April of 2021, Richard Cottenham would confess to a 1974 double homicide that took place in Montville, New Jersey. This case, this had been one of the most notorious unsolved cold cases that New Jersey has ever seen. Now, this confession had been extracted from Richard Cottenham by Robert Anzalotti just weeks before he retired. This is how long this guy's working alongside Richard Cottenham. Could you imagine? the rotten luck. Now these were facilitated by Vronsky and also Jennifer Wise, who was a daughter of Dida Gudarzi. Now Vronsky and Jennifer, they had been visiting Cottenham since 2017, counselling him to get a confession out of him. And listen, this guy was apparently just weeks away from his retirement, right? But in 2023, he's still at it. Robert Anzalotti, still going strong. And he was able to get another confession out of Richard Cottenham for the 1967 murder of a 17 year old girl. And now as I always do, I just want to make sure I'm covering off every single victim that we know of in this case. For me, that's really important because that is the whole reason why we're here, why I do what I do, is to memorialize these victims and let their stories be heard. So this is the victims that we were able to find from the confessions. I'm saying we're we were able to find as if I was in there with Robert Anzalotti, but you know what I mean, like, 
These are the victims I identified from the confessions and I'm going to tell you about them. So I am going to start by discussing the victims from the 1960s just so we can work in that sort of order. So Mary Ann Della Sala, she was only 17 years old when she would disappear from her shift at work. She would disappear around 9pm on January the 24th of 1967 and devastatingly her body wouldn't even be found until three months later on April the 20th. Now her body was in the Passaic River. Police had concluded by examination that she had been killed elsewhere by strangulation and then dumped in the Passaic River in Hawthorne, New Jersey. Also, just to say, I'm not trying to do like a sexy, croaky thing in my voice. Like, I'm literally just losing my voice because I talk too much. So, certified japper. Now, Nancy Shieva Vogel, she was 29 years old, happily married with children, when her body would be found in her own vehicle in Ridgefield Park. Her body would be found on October the 30th of 1967. Now, Nancy had last been seen three days prior when she had left her home saying that she was going to go and play bingo with her friends at the local church. Nancy, however, she decided that she wanted to go shopping, so she headed over to the mall in Bergen County. It sounds like rapid gunfire outside. Like, what's a gal to do? Yep. Okay, I think that's him done. Who knows? You must be joking. And devastatingly, whilst Nancy was here, just going about her day and wanting to do some shopping, she would be kidnapped by Richard Cottenham. He had took her to a field in Montvale where he proceeded to strangle her to death. And what's so sickening is Nancy knew Richard Cottenham. So, you know, we're saying that she was kidnapped, which she was, obviously. She was taken somewhere against her will. But she might have went willingly with Richard to start with because she knew him. Now, Jacqueline Leah Harp, she was only 13 years old when she would disappear. She vanished on July the 17th of 1968 in Midland Park, New Jersey. Now, on the morning of July the 18th, her deceased body would be found and she was discovered at Goffelbrook, which is a tri tri bleh, 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 what is it, Anna? A tributary, a tributary to the Passaic River. Jacqueline, she had been brutally beaten around her face. She had been strangled with a leather strap from her flag sling. And devastatingly, it was determined that Jacqueline had been the victim of a severe sexual assault, but they did conclude that she hadn't been raped. But Cottenham, he had admitted that he tried to persuade Jacqueline to get in his vehicle, but 13-year-old Jacqueline resisted. She did not want to go with Cottenham. Now, when she didn't want to go, Richard Cottenham drove his vehicle, pulled up in front of her and started chasing after her. Now, Jacqueline, she tried her best to run away, but ultimately, Richard was too quick for her and he pulled her into the bushes where he would strangle her to death. Now, Irene Blassie, she was 18 years old when she was reported missing on April the 7th of 1969. Devastatingly, on April the 8th, she would be found lying face down in Saddle River, which was around four feet deep. Irene had been strangled with the chain of her crucifix that she had been wearing. Tottenham, he confessed that he had seen Irene shopping in Hackensack and he was able to convince Irene to go for a drink with him. So they took a cab to a different location, they spent some time together, they're having a couple of drinks and then Richard Cottenham, he offers to take Irene back to the bus station. But instead, this sick, evil monster would drive her to a remote location against her will before raping and murdering her fireworks are going off i was kind of hoping that they might calm down by the time i have finished my makeup but they have not so i'm just going to continue and in editing i'll see if i can edit it out somehow but i can't make any promises 15 year old denise falska she left her home in new jersey on july the 13th of 1969 now she had left to meet her friends in westwood and she was scheduled to be home by 11 p.m as you can imagine, 11pm comes and goes and Denise still isn't home. Now, witnesses, they had claimed to see Denise walking along Old Hook Road in Emerson towards Westwood around 9pm. Devastatingly, Denise's body would be found on the side of Westminster Place in Saddlebrook. 
Her body was found on July the 14th. Cottenham had claimed that he had drove up alongside Denise and asked her if she wanted a ride, to which Denise had accepted. Cottenham had then proceeded to drive 15-year-old Denise to his former high school and in this parking lot, he forced Denise to perform oral sex on him this 15 year old girl. He said that he was so dissatisfied and disappointed with her lack of sexual experience, he decided that she had to die. Then we have Lorraine Marie Kelly, who was 16, and Marianne Pryor, who was 17. They had left their homes in North Bergen, New Jersey, because they wanted to go shopping at Garden State Plaza. They left on August the 9th of 1974, and Kelly's boyfriend dropped them off at the bus station, and the girls, they had planned that from the bus station, they would hitchhike to Garden State Plaza shopping mall. Now, devastatingly, on August the 14th, the dead bodies of both of these young girls would be found. Their bodies had been discarded in a wooded location, and this was close to the Ridgemont Garden Complex in Montville. Both of these young girls were completely naked, and they were bound to each other by their hands and their wrists, both placed lying face down. Both of these young girls had been brutally beaten, they had both been brutally raped and they both had ligature marks on their necks as if they had been strangled. Now Richard Cottenham, he had confessed that he kidnapped these girls and then tied them up and raped them in a motel room. I don't know how he got them there but he said that he did and he had actually murdered them by drowning them both in the bathtub. On August the 26th, 2022, again, not that long ago at all. With a non-prosecution agreement, officials in Rockland County, they corroborated and accepted Cottenham's confession to the 1970 murder of 26-year-old Lorraine McGraw. In June of 2022, Richard Cottenham, he was arraigned in his prison hospital bed for the 1968 murder of Diane Cusick. The case of Diane Cusick is actually believed to be the oldest case solved just by DNA evidence. So Cottenham, he pleads guilty in court on December the 5th and he actually admitted to the murders of four other women. These murders were said to take place between 1972 and 1973. Now these victims were Mary Beth Hines, Laverne Moy, Sheila Hyman, and Marie Emerita Rosado Neves. Diane Cusick, she was a 23 year old dance teacher from Long Island, New York, and her deceased body would be found on February the 16th of 1968. She had been beaten, raped, and strangled, and DNA extracted from a semen sample at the scene of the crime was a match to Richard Cottenham. But Lorraine McGraw, she was a 26 year old woman who had been missing since February the 27th of 1970. Marks around her neck had indicated that she had been strangled to death. On May the 10th of 1972, the deceased body of Mary Beth Hines would be discovered. She had cuts on her face and her neck, her neck had cuts from being strangled, and Richard Cottenham would later confess that he murdered her and then threw her off a bridge like she was nothing. 23 year old Laverne Moy, her body would also be discovered in a creek on July the 20th of 1972. Now Richard Cottenham, he would later confess that he murdered Laverne and then discarded of her body in the same way that he did Mary Beth Hines. Her body was threw off of the same bridge. On July the 20th of 1973, the body of Sheila Hyman, who was 33 years old, would be discovered. Her own husband would find his wife deceased in their bathtub, in their master bedroom, in their home when he returned home from shopping at the mall. Maria Neves, she was only 18 years old when she would be found dead on December the 7th of 1973. She had been strangled to death and disposed of in a weeded area. She had been wrapped up in grey blankets and also plastic bags. Richard Cottenham, he had actually confessed to another murder of a woman by the name of Lisa Thomas. However, this wasn't taken seriously. The police, they didn't believe his story. The scenario that he put it in didn't really line up with Lisa's murder. And so he was never charged or convicted with her death. 
Police and investigators, they believe that there are many names that will still have to come to light that were victims of Richard Cottenham. They believe that Richard Cottenham has murdered at least 100 victims. To this very day, Richard Cottenham is incarcerated at the New Jersey State Prison and he is serving a life sentence. But how is that enough for a man who does all of this? I get that maybe in this case, death penalty maybe isn't great because we need to get the names of his remaining victims to try and get their justice. But this man, my God, should not be allowed to live or at least when he dies, I hope he is tortured and I hope he goes to hell and is tortured for all eternity. When Richard had been interviewed on multiple occasions, interviews that you can watch online by the way, because a lot of them are very, very recent, but he was asked why he would murder in the first place. He told the investigators that the murder was mainly psychological and he actually seen the act of murder as a game. And I just want to read the quote that I've got here so I don't get it wrong. But he had stated, I was able to get almost any woman to do whatever I wanted them to do psychologically. It's godlike almost. You are in complete control of somebody's destiny. I think that tells you all you need to know about this guy about this horrific evil monster who felt like he could play God with innocent women's lives. As always, I just want to do the 360 and bring it right back to the victims of today's case who are the important people of this case, who are the ones that should be remembered, not Richard Cottenham, not the cotton candy haired freak. He does not deserve any remembrance or memorialization because he is an evil monster and I hope he gets what's coming to him. But these victims and these victims' families, I am sending love, prayer and strength to. What they endured and what their families have had to endure in the aftermath is unfathomable. And no one should ever suffer that way. All of these women are people who are loved and cherished and adored, who had their lives ripped away from them by this sick, sadistic monster. And I just hope and pray that wherever they are now, they are resting peacefully. But my loves, that is the end of another true crime and makeup video. I really hope this one was interesting for you. For him being such a prolific serial killer, there is barely any coverage of him online. And I'll be honest, I only really stumbled across him when I learned about the Rodney Alcala case. Completely forgot about him and then when I actually covered the Rodney Alcala case, it all came flooding back. Before I go though, please make sure you are subscribed with that notification bell on. You know the drill, I upload twice a week, every single week, and it would mean the world to me if you would be here with me, support me along the way, maybe leave a comment for the engagement. I also want to know what you think about this evil monster. Slag them off, go at it. I love to slag off these monsters. It's honestly becoming a real hobby of mine. I should honestly just create a video slagging off every single serial killer or murderer or horrific human being that ever existed because that would make my day and I bet it would make some of yours. Also, the merch. The merch is coming and soon I will sport it for you on camera. Um, I'm just trying to get some final bits sorted out because I have got a lot of designs and it's just working out which ones I really love and which ones are a bit, eh, they're all right but not my favourite. I just really want to have something to put out like before Christmas in case you guys want to pick anything up. If you don't, that's absolutely fine. Like no pressure at all. But I know a lot of you have been asking for some merch, certified Japper merch, all that jazz. So I have been working on some bits behind the scenes for you. If there is any details that you want to know of any products used on my face today, they will be linked down below alongside my social media handles, my Instagram and TikTok. If you want to give me a follow there, I really come alive during the festive period, so I would highly recommend. You can leave your case suggestions in the comments down below, but don't forget I do have a Google Doc where you can submit your case suggestions just to make sure they come through. And that is also linked down below in the description. But that is it for today. Please remember, be a good person, do not be a bad person, stay safe, look after each other, and I will see you in the next one. Bye!